Our guest today is Christina Ellis. She's the owner of Business by Intention and the author of You Don't Need Permission. Christina, welcome to our show today. Thank you. I'm excited because we always do these pre-interview conversations. And as Christina knows, I was cracking up. I was like, what? So, so, so Christina, tell us a little bit about your, your upbringing, any moments as a kid that really stand out as a reflection and a vision to where you are now. Yeah, I guess, you know, Christopher, it started when I was five. And um, my dad, he was, you know, the apple of my eye. He was, uh, he had his business degree. He had his pilot's license. He was an amazing artist and a musician and charismatic and everybody loved him. And he came home one day and he said um, he was kicking it all in and going to move to San Diego and become homeless. And, uh, you know, aside from any emotional or psychological issues that are there as a, as a five-year-old me, it struck me at that time that, gosh, you know, I can do and be whoever I want to be any given day. And that sort of, that sort of lesson stuck with me through my whole life. But Christine, that's interesting because if, if my father told me he's leaving, I'd be scared. Whereas in your case, you felt it liberated. So did you actually move with your family, with your father to San Diego or? No, I didn't want to become homeless. <laughs> that was his choice. No, I stayed with my mom and she continued to work and we had a little place to live and it was, we, you just carry on, right? That we all have challenges. Interesting. So tell us about your, your, when you went to school, I know you mentioned you're, you were a big rule breaker. Um, <laughs> tell us about that. Like, what are some examples that, that you can share with our, our audience? Yeah, I always, it wasn't in just to break rules for, to break rules. It was that I was always questioning why people were doing the things they were doing. It didn't matter if it was teachers or other students or. I'm sure your teachers know. loved you, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They loved me so much. My principal actually really loved me because I had my own chair in his office. And so I was forever getting sent, you know, go, go down to the office. I was like, I know I have a chair there. That's okay. So let's just stop there for a moment because again, so much of life is during those junctures, those moments where again, your father leaves you, you're like, okay, I'm going to learn to be independent. And even these things, most people when they're in school, they hate to be pointed out. They hate to have the teachers point things out. But in your case, it was so normal. So I'm curious, paint a one specific picture where what did you do wrong or in, in their eyes? Did you talk back to them? Did you throw something at your classmates? Give us an example yeah. of why you're, you're breaking well, these rules. It wasn't bad. I mean, it wasn't like bad things. I would question like why we had to do something or why a teacher was doing something in class or why we had this homework assignment where it just seemed like busy work to me or, you know, why can't we do this instead of that? I was not great. So, so when a teacher got tired of you essentially asking questions, which is a good thing, she or he just said, Christina, go to the principal's office. Yes, yes. And then what would you actually do in the principal's office? Because I've actually never been in the principal's office. I mean, <laughs> oh, well, there's all kinds of, I, we, I would sit and talk to the principal for hours and we would really? talk about, yeah, how to make the school better and how do we improve on communication and why that teacher doesn't teach that class and why she's teaching this class. And yes. <laughs> that's, that's such a telling story, Christina, because again, you would eventually become a coach, an entrepreneur. But this questioning minds is so powerful because you can't really help people unless you're discerning like you are. So with that mentality as a teenager, what happened in college or after college? Or tell us about what, what ended up happening after that point. So I went off to college like I was supposed to and um, ended up going uh, to Northern Arizona University. And same thing, that insatiable curiosity and always wanting to know why. Um, got called into the dean's office at the Christmas break and got told I was wasting my parents' money. And I said, ha, huh, I got a student loan. I'm not wasting my parents' money. And he said, don't bother coming back after the Christmas break. And so um, I went home and uh, bought a little VW rabbit and decided that I could learn a lot more if I just traveled, traveled and met people and had experiences. And so I took off that summer and traveled for, I think it was probably about eight or nine months in my little VW Rabbit all across Canada and the US and Mexico and just met people and had uh, just, it was an amazing trip. So tell us, Christina, do you feel that I know you had a father's role model because as I'm listening to this and hearing it, I'm thinking over time you might learn these things, but you're quite young at the time. How do you tell people that are listening or watching right now? Well, 
Christina, I'm not that bold. I'm not that courageous. So how do you go about sharing that? Because you say it as just, oh, this is just who I am, Christopher. But there are serious challenges and serious consequences of being that bold and that open, especially if you're driving around. You don't know. Like the first thing is like, what if the, what if the tire, uh, you know, if you have a flat tire or you right. meet some crazy person, how did you go through that mindset? Or even if you had that, frankly, at that time? I mean, at 18, you, you don't have that mindset, right? That was just stupid. I remember asking a family member why they would, because I traveled to their homes and stuff. I said, why would you, <laughs> why would, I was an 18 year old girl. Why would anybody even, why no one stop me? And my aunt said to me, there was nobody that was going to stop you. And so we just want to make sure you were okay along the way. But it, to your question, I think what it comes from is a very strong sense of values. So I'm very clear on what my values are as a person and who I want to be. And so it's not, it's, it's, it's not hard to be bold or courageous if you know who you are. That's important. That's such an important lesson, Christina. And when did you start realizing that you could be a coach, a, a business owner, a person that wants to help other people really succeed in their businesses in their own life? Yeah, I was a coach younger for sports. And so I really enjoyed it. I, I loved you know, it didn't matter what the sport was. I loved working with kids and helping them see how they could be better, how they could improve, what could they, and it really wasn't about them being a better athlete. It was about them being a better person. Mm -hmm. And by better, that doesn't mean that was my judgment. It was about, through them, what they, what they saw themselves as being better. Um, and then I got the opportunity to be a business coach and it just was such a perfect fit. It just dovetailed with my personality. And let's talk about coaching, Christina, because when you look at athletes, as you talked about athletics and whatnot, no great athlete, whether you're Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Serena Williams, they all have coaches. Yeah. But people, unfortunately, business owners, unfortunately, a lot of them don't. They don't think that, that, they, that they should invest or they, they, there's, there's like a disconnect. But yet we look at any athlete, they all have coaches. So right. for you, talk to us specifically about coaching. How do you go about helping? Because I know you said you have an intention marketing type of background. Talk to us about some of the clients you've worked with and how you'd be able to help him or her grow their business. Yeah, look, see, here's the deal. We all have, we all have our own perspective, right? And so, and, and we can't see other people's perspectives. We can't see what's outside of our own perspective. And so a coach is so incredibly important because you get this second perspective on the way that you're acting in your business, the things that you're doing, maybe your communication methods, the way your expectations, the way you manage people, they can give you a different perspective. And I think it's incredibly important. I have coaches still that help me, um, I have marketing coaches and business coaches. And, and so it's, it's important to have that second perspective. I had a, a lady that said, a new client, and she said, I looked at your LinkedIn and I see you've never been a CEO. What makes you think you can tell me how to be a CEO? And I said, that is a great question. I said, you don't see a lot of what is happening in your business. My job is to, is to point those things out to you. I said, your employees are probably saying yes to everything you say. It's my job to show you where that's not necessarily good. And I said, I guarantee you can go out and watch any golf tournament and Tiger Woods' coach is not competing against him, mm -hmm. right? That's just, it's a different level of of uh, professionalism, it's a different level of skill set. It's just it's the pers it's the perspective that's so valuable. Yeah, and the the best, the best analogy is if you're driving a car and and your client's the driver, you want someone that has a more of a bird's eye view because you can see things that she can or he can because again they're focused on driving the car, they're driving the business, and it's a great perspective you mentioned because it all is about perspective. So talk to us about okay, so you're doing this work with these these business owners, and then you decide to write books. <laughs> Yes. Yes. So over the years, I've uh, been a business, uh, business coach for over 10 years. And it occurred to me after about three or four years that here are these people, they're highly educated, they're very driven, they seem like they're confident. And yet, time and time again, everything that they said led me to believe like they were looking for permission. They were looking for someone to reaffirm their decisions and who they were and what they were doing. And it became really clear to me that there was a book there about, you don't need permission. 
And so I wrote the book, You Don't Need Permission, uh, Finding Your Path to a Purely Authentic Life. And it, in it is what you were talking about earlier, Christopher, is how do you be bold? How do you be courageous? Where does that confidence come from? And so it walks you through what are those things that you need to start to cultivate in yourself so you stand on your own and you don't need permission. And that's great. So Christina, let's first talk about purely authentic life. How do you define that? You know, Christopher, you and I were talking, I hate the word authentic, and I could not think of another word. It feels so squishy, like authentic. It's so cliche, right? And yet it's the word that fits because I, what I mean by authentic is what's true for you, not anybody else's definition, not anybody else's expectation. What is true for you in your life? And especially as women, we get under this where we have, there's all these expectations and these, there's these you know, roles that we're supposed to play and we're supposed to be a super mom and we forget about who we truly are at our core. And I'm hoping that the book helps women find their way back to that. Yeah. yeah. And I want to dive even deeper because again, when you say purely authentic life, it, it's, I, I geek out on words, you know, so every word has meaning. And unfortunately, when you look at these Gallup polls, 87% of employees in the U S and I'm guessing around the world don't like their jobs, dislike their jobs are disinterested in their jobs. So clearly they're not living an authentic life. So let's first talk about why you think so many people in life don't even know that authenticity in themselves. What do you think some of the biggest challenges that you see in your in your personal and professional life? Well, um, it, I actually go through that, like in the first four or five chapters is we have all of these messages coming at us all of the time through our life. We have it through, you know, expectations of our parents, of our school teachers, of our friends. And then we have, we have you know, if you are involved in any sort of religion, there's, there's all of these other set of rules that we have to follow. There's roles that we play as a man or a woman, right? And there's, so we are, there's this constant barrage of all of the expectations and, and um, ideas and messages of who we're supposed to be. And we forget to stop back and be intentional about it and go, wait a second, who do I actually want to be? Mm. I love that, Christina. I mean, frankly, you clearly are not just an audacious, intelligent person, but you're very introspective and you can't really help people unless you don't think a lot. And what it, what it sounds like you're saying is you first have to make an assessment of where you're at. Where are these expectations coming from? Like, like for me, for instance, I mean, my mom and dad, they always wanted me to do well in school and society. I went to Catholic school and I'm a you know, son of an immigrant. So all these expectations of what to do. And it wasn't until I got older, I'm like, oh, okay, now I know why I'm so freaking ambitious only because my parents had this expectation. But I love the fact that you also convey in a, in a very genuine and authentic way that these things you're mentioning is not easy to share because no one wants to look at their life with a mirror and saying, hey, you might want to look at what you're doing and first make an assessment of where they came from. So now once they have that assessment, what's the next step after that, Christina? So that's the second part of the book is let's find out what are your values, right? Let's define them for you. Let's figure out so I call it my mission essential. It's me, right? What is my mission in life? What, when I'm at the very end and it's my last day and I'm looking back on my life, did I fulfill that thing that I wanted to fulfill in my life, right? So we talk about your core values. We talk about your mission essential. We talk about how do we fail spectacularly? Like how do we take on these really big things and, and, and try to accomplish them or, or adjust who we are to, to do something completely out of our comfort zone? And so the book goes through and, and helps uh, people work through that. Okay, great. I get, I get, I got all these expectations on me. I'm not being authentic. How do I do that? That's the second part of the book. It's, it'll help you define that for yourself. And again, Christopher, I want to be really clear here. It is not my goal to say you should be more successful. Or you should achieve more. You should, that is not it at all. It's that you be true to who you are. You find your, your compass. Yeah. yeah and it, again, our society, for instance, a lot of people say, oh, Christopher, uh, Christina, like you're so successful. And they say, well, and I guess it's my, me, me, I'm always thinking, look, just because I'm ambitious or driven doesn't mean I'm successful. It's going back to you, authentic life. Because my mother, frankly, was not very ambitious. She was a school teacher, but I loved her. And she was one of the most successful, quote unquote, people that I knew in my life. Now, yes. for you, you talked about failing splendidly, failing Spectacularly. Spectacularly. Yes. I love that because Sarah Blakely, billionaire who created Spanx, she talked about how her father, every week they would have dinners 
and her father would be disappointed in Sarah if she didn't fail. And so Sarah would be looking for things to fail. So tell us about a failure that you had that was, was like fun, spectacular, and, and, and just puts a smile on your face as it would mine or the viewers and listeners. Yeah. So, you know, funny story, just on the side, I'll give you it. When my kids were little, when they would come home, I would say, show me the grass stains on your jeans. <laughs> That's awesome. And they would say, what? And I'd say, show me the grass stains. And they'd say, well, I don't have any grass. I said, tomorrow I want you to come home. I want you to have grass stains. And they said, but most parents don't want their kids that. And I said, I want you to have grass stains on your jeans. That means you're doing something, right? But as far as me, I um, I am an artist and um, I decided I had, I. I got into a fight with the principal at my children's school because they weren't running an art program like I felt like they should. And so I opened up an art school um, and began running that. Unfortunately, we didn't, we'd only been going about six months when the, what was it, 2008, when the, when the everything, we lost everything, right? The bubble popped and everybody. Um, and so I, I lost a lot of my clients then that couldn't afford to pay for art school. And so the, the art school failed. Uh, in uh, from an outside perspective. Um, but the funny thing was, was, you know, fast forward a few years and now I'm a business coach and my daughters came to me and they were like, do they know about the art school that it failed? And I was like, yeah, that's okay. Failure is a lesson, right? I learned so much in that failure. That's awesome. Now, now going back to your book, so it's about first assessing where these expectations come from and then doing things of value moving forward. So is it just a two-part book or? No, it's, well, it's, uh, yeah, I guess it is. It is two-part. It's to point out, here's where this may be coming from mm -hmm. and here's what to do about it, right? And what do you think, because I, I know you've you worked with so many business owners. Is, is there one thing, like let's say as a speaker, people always ask me, Christopher, how do you command so much money for a speech? And they never know the answer. The actual answer is your branding. They're trying to pitch a, a Ferrari, Louis Vuitton brand, but their marketing conveys more of a Honda Civic and nothing more than Honda Civic, I'm just saying a certain branding. So that's one clear defined thing I've learned over 20 plus years as a speaker. For you, are there any like real key things that our listeners and viewers can say, look, Christina, you're amazing. And you have found consistently that business owners you know, it, the, if it's for, I don't think it's so much the branding, Christopher, I think it's bigger than that. Business owners fail to implement. Mm. And so like I, I, I love my book. I think there's a ton of great information in there. And if you do nothing with it, it's just paper, like it's nothing. And so it's the same thing with business owners, the, the failure to implement, right? Whether it be branding, whether it be raising your prices, whether it be whatever, you, you know, to get you to that higher price, you've got to implement, you've got to apply those things in your life, in your business, in whatever it is you're trying to achieve. Yeah, I love that. You know, your book, You Don't Need Permission, it's one of those phrases that stick with me in my mind. And I remember very, very clearly as a kid, I was very angry because I always had to ask permission from my mom, my dad, everyone around me. And it just really irked and annoyed me. So I love the title of that book. And ultimately, what do you really want to move toward? Because you've done all these great things with your own life, with your kid's life, with your business owners. But at this point, the, the final thing I want you to share, what do you think you really want our listeners and our viewers to, to end with, to, to really yeah. feel your, your, your message? That's a great question, Christopher. Here's what I want. Like, ideally, I want people to read the book. I want them to understand the principles. And then what I'm seeing is happening is there's this sort of movement that's beginning to happen. And we've began affectionately calling it the beautiful bitch club. <laughs> and it is for women who want to take the principles in the book and start to apply them to their life, whether it means a business person, an artist, a parent, whatever it is. And what I would ultimately what I want to do is get back to my days in the VW rabbit. And I want to uh, renovate a school bus and travel around and interview these women, these beautiful bitches that are living the principles of the book. You don't need permission. Christina, as you're sharing the story, I can literally visualize you driving around. But that's so important because I'm not a parent and I have kids. I've done a lot of mentoring with students, but I always remember people saying that. It's not what you say that you tell your kids, it's what you do. Mm -hmm. And 
in a sense, all of your clients, not so much your kids, but they're learning from your example. So I love the fact that you are consistently showing by example, implementing, executing what you've done all throughout your life so that when people hear this podcast, listen to this show, they'll really be inspired as I am, frankly, because everyone wants to be led and they want to have fun too. And for you to just have that bold title, I already know that it's going to be a great movement that we can all jump into, even if we're not women, as a man, <laughs> I'm excited too. Christina, thank you so much for being on our show. Have a great day. Thank you, Christopher. It's an honor to be with you.